to the next panel moderator, uh, Dr. Penny Renigans, uh, Director of the School of Computing and Information Sciences at University of Maine. Penny. Thank you, Ali. Uh, in this next segment, we'll turn to the needs and resources for education and workforce development to support the growth in AI capabilities. I'm Penny Reingans. I'm director of the School of Computing and Information Sciences here at UMaine. I'm pleased to be joined by Jason Judd, director of Educate Maine, Sharmila Mukhopadhe, director of the UMaine Frontier Institute for Research and Sensor Technology, and Walter Rall, president of the IEEE Maine section. We'll each give a short statement, and then we've left plenty of time for answer your questions at the end. So please use the Q&A box to send us your questions. Uh, Jason will lead off with some thoughts about K-12 education. Great. Thanks, Penny. Great. Hopefully everybody can see my slides now and uh, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm excited to, to be here. I've already learned a lot about, uh, from this conversation so far. And I was asked to talk about uh, what's happening in, in, in K-12 education as it relates to artificial intelligence. Intelligence, as, as Penny mentioned, I'm the executive director of Educate Maine and Educate Maine is a business-led education advocacy organization, which is focused on increasing education attainment and career readiness. Uh, we facilitate a program called Project Login um, which is really about building Maine's tech workforce, um, working with K-12 schools, higher education institutions, as well as employers. So we like to, we like to kind of work with everybody who's supporting this, this work, um, you know, uh, moving forward. So what I wanted to do is give you a sense of uh, what's happening with artificial intelligence right now in Maine um, and what the K-12 system looks like. So I wanted to pull together this nice graphic which really describes the, the five big ideas in K-12 education as it relates to artificial intelligence because I, I think you can naturally kind of think about you know, what are some of those building blocks uh, in addition to sort of a strong math and science uh, foundation um, and computer science foundation um, where uh, students are beginning to learn what AI is and teachers are beginning to learn what AI is and, and learning some of those skills. And you can see that some of these, the skill and knowledge you can, you can certainly learn in, in computer science classes, but you can also learn in classes like, you know, social sciences and engineering and science and math, et cetera. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about computer science um, education here in Maine to just remind folks of kind of what the climate looks like. Uh, in Maine, about 40% of our schools have uh, computer science offerings. Um, and certainly that's a number that we're trying to uh, increase collectively so that all Maine students have uh, computer science instruction in the K-12 system so that they can get excited about uh, potential majors that relate to this area uh, in the higher ed system. So there's a, a number of different initiatives happening. One is the CS for Maine Coalition, which is a whole group of organizations working together um, on policy as well as on teacher professional development to get computer science into, into more schools and to help train more teachers on how to teach computer science. Um, the Department of Education here in Maine has also uh, worked on a computer science education state plan um, for that really maps out what the next couple of years needs to look like uh, for Maine to continue to scale up computer science activities. And then we have a number of active teacher professional development programs, some through the universities, some through nonprofits that are teaching teachers that are brand new to computer science, how to be computer science teachers. And certainly a lot of that different curriculum has not only building blocks, uh, you know, that connects to artificial intelligence, but specific lessons um, that, that students can do to explore uh, this particular topic. Uh, also, our code activities um, and other sort of uh, short-term lessons are one way for students and educators to learn uh, what, what artificial intelligence is all about and how it connects to um, the work they're doing in K-12 schools. Broadly, we have more work we need to do in this area uh, to make sure that our young people have a good understanding of AI and computer science um, before they get to the higher education system. So I also wanted to talk really briefly about um, something that's in common with both the K-12 system and the higher education system, which is, which is a reliance on internships and experiential learning activities. Uh, we want to make sure that the young people can explore these skills directly with employers in addition to in the classroom. We run a program called Fo the Focus Main Intern Experience uh, with more than 600 interns that come to us during the summertime 
um, and we're the convening organization for them. And many of those students are in computer science related internships in Maine. Um, and what we hear from employers is the more experience, knowledge, and interest young people have in artificial intelligence, the more marketable they are to getting those on competitive internships. So among our employer community that we work closely with, there's certainly interest um, in uh, the expansion of these uh, experiential learning opportunities, both as students finish high school, um, as well as uh, move ahead to their college um, experience as well. So I, I, I couldn't uh, present without really emphasizing partnerships, uh, which is, you know, this particular presentation this afternoon, I think is a good illustration of kind of leveraging a lot of different folks with different expertise from all perspectives and, uh, and uh, you know, making sure that, uh, um, making sure that, uh, you know, we can really all work together on this uh, particular um, topic. So there's a couple of good uh, things I want to share, which is one, simply information sharing is really essential. Um, connecting formal partnerships with both K-12, the higher ed institutions, as well as the employers. Working together on teacher professional development and using sort of joint um, assets and expertise to be able to uh, leverage these opportunities and apply for particular grants together, um, as well as really convening, hopefully in person in the future. Uh, the, the Computer Science Teachers Association will be coming to USM in October for all of all of New England. So that's a great opportunity for us to do some work together and do some conference sessions where we're able to to put a spotlight on what's happening here in Maine, as well as collaborate with our New England peers. And with that, I'll turn it back to Penny. Thank you, Jason. And I'm hoping our hosts will turn my video back on. Um, thank you. So uh, building on the foundation of what Jason's talked about, I want to move on, talk a little bit about how we can follow up on that foundation in higher education. Okay. At the undergraduate level, uh, cultivation of AI skills and expertise are really part of a broader base uh, that must include courses in program design and development, statistical foundations, electives in AI and supporting technologies, and applications to real problems needing AI solutions. Uh, the UMaine program, uh, undergraduate program, sort of best embodying that is the Bachelor of Science in Computer Science. This ABET accredited program provides a foundation in that program, design and development, in system fun fundamentals, mathematical foundations, uh, and ethics. And it culminates in a two semester capstone uh, that emphasizes professional practice and, and the skills that students will need to survive or to, to, to uh, excel in the workforce. It also offers electives in AI related areas like uh, art AI, machine learning, computer vision, cloud computing, and privacy. Alternatively, students can enhance a major in pretty much anything with a minor in either computer science or statistics. Graduate programs offer a greater opportunity to specialize and to develop AI skills and expertise. Three UMaine program, degree programs have substantial AI content. The first are the master's and PhD programs in computer science, which help uh, develop the background needed to innovate in AI technology and applications. A cluster of master's, PhD, and certificate programs in the spatial informatics area allow students from a wide range of backgrounds to develop the ability to apply this new technology to uh, analyze spatial data. And finally, the main uh, MBA offers a new concentration in business analytics that Tim just mentioned that trains students in the processing and analyzing large scale business data to extract valuable information and then discover meaningful business knowledge to, uh, to recommend optimal business decisions. Additionally, uh, many UMaine graduate programs in other disciplinary areas offer specialized courses or course topics or project opportunities that apply AI tools to challenges in that field. These disciplines range from math and science to engineering to the social sciences. Okay. 
three new programs under development will offer even more opportunities for students who wish to acquire the background needed to join the AI workforce in the future. A proposed minor in business and information systems will bring business analytics to the undergraduate level. A proposed master of science that Tim mentioned in business analytics from the main business school will increase graduate opportunities in this area. And finally, a cluster of proposed graduate programs in data science and engineering will be accessible to students from a wide variety of, of backgrounds. These programs build on foundations in program development, statistics, and systems, and address themes in data collection techniques, data representation and management, management, data analytics, including AI, data visualization and human-centered computing, data security, uh, preservation, and reuse. The initial application area domain specializations will include spatial informatics, bioinformatics and biomedicine, business information, social and behavioral data science, and engineering analytics. And with that, I'll hand the floor to Sharmila, who will talk about AI workforce development. Thank you, Penny. Uh, let me share this, my slides. Hopefully you can see my slides. Uh, what I will talk about are a few areas on the related to workforce development. And I'm from the Frontier Institute of Research in Sensor Technologies. So I'll talk a little bit about understanding the broader ecosystem for AI and stay with one application example, which is on everybody's mind right now, is pandemic response, and make a few comments about the educational workforce. So if we think of the broader AI ecosystem, a lot of times what we, we are thinking of is there is an application area, which could be anything, which AI is uh, going to be applied to, and the ones I've marked in red are the ones I see very pertinent to humane. And then you have sensors or other data collection kind of agencies, which is the perception function. You collect all that, and then you have the brain component of AI, which is like maybe layers of sense learning and reasoning. And you did hear a lot beyond simple algorithms. You have the machine learning and the deeper learnings. And then that creates some logistics of how to respond, maybe through a, another set of hardware components like robotics or actuators, et cetera, or decision-making, business decision-making to improve the application. So with that kind of a background, uh, I, like I said, I'll stay with one example, one subset of all the application areas, one subset of healthcare is pandemic response. So if you look at where AI is helping in pandemic response, again, that's a huge area, helping right now and can help in future. Let me just uh, you know, stay with a few. One could be the testing, one would be drug and equipment you know, uh, sort of uh, development, the other is contact tracing, supply chain, et cetera. And uh, the, again, few uh, topics are marked in red. These are the areas where I myself and some of my colleagues and Frontier Institute are involved in. And just to give you an understanding of what the workforce needs to understand, even within a given topic, the work could be at the research level. So this is like a bench research you know, work I would do in my lab is trying to compile or design a hardware a component for sensing different aspects. And then AI would sort of help us maybe quicken this uh, process and then go into some clinical level downsize what's important and then collect the data from that and provide the feedback loop. So this can happen in different specific applications. So based on these applications, I wanted to spend a little time on what would the workforce, AI workforce, what do we think would be useful to succeed so just to give you an example, these might be two areas which we hear a lot how AI is currently helping and can be improved for the pandemic response uh, application. And the immediate need we see is that AI professionals need better understanding of the application. The application professionals also need to better understand the AI professionals, how they're thinking or what the algorithms can do, cannot do. So my suggestion is, and I think a lot of uh, you know, areas, it's important that we create application specific modules within the education system. And those should be collaborate, 
relatively developed by faculty from both sides. And then going forward, the mantra for effective education would be cross-disciplinary training. And there are several approaches for that, maybe AI specific courses, co-mentored projects, you know, student teams. So this could be, this is just an example I'm throwing out. Facial recognition is a known AI component. Fever detector is a known sensor technologies, depending on how simple to how complex that is. You can combine to have this design, a disease surveillance kind of, uh, you know, improvements in AI or future AI. And without taking much time, I wanted to end with one need I feel we need to instill among AI professionals is the critical thinking part because they perhaps would be better than others to quickly evaluate the credibility of the information that is generated by or manipulated by machines. So that would be a very important component of the AI workforce. So with that, I would hand it over to Jason. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to the University of Maine for uh, inviting me to participate in this presentation. Uh, my name is Walter Rall. I am the chair of the IEEE Maine section. Uh, recently, I've launched a small startup in the space of artificial intelligence and autonomous systems. And during the day, I work at General Dynamics, Ordnance and Tactical Systems in SACO. And uh, it provides a very unique opportunity for me to uh, see this domain from an industry perspective. In the few minutes I have, I would like to chat a little bit about uh, tangible economic uh, impact uh, of artificial intelligence and some specific uh, pursuits I've been involved in. And then from a workforce pivot perspective, I wanted to talk about two things. First, the domain of uh, available resources for uh, an existing workforce that is interested in, uh, in pivoting. And then secondly, to investigate some fundamental ideas around what uh, research and development AI workforce needs to be equipped with. So to talk about the um, economic opportunities, uh, I've recently been involved in some solicitations from the US Navy. Uh, there are two that I wanted to highlight here. The first one is around Naval Depot modernization and sustainment. Uh, the U.S. Navy, of course, has uh, got billions of dollars uh, tied up in sustainment activities. Uh, most importantly is uh, logistics and maintenance around uh, condition-based maintenance, prognostics and health management, etc. And the slide top left sort of indicates the, uh, the application of artificial intelligence to that domain. But more importantly, for those who are involved with uh, possibly BIW or um, activities associated with uh, the marine industry in Maine. Uh, the photo on the right is a, a screen capture of a Trident nuclear submarine uh, missile. And recently the US Navy launched a solicitation looking for machine learning based da data analytics for the autonomous navigation of these. To give you an idea of the economic impact, the US Navy is number one in its uh, pursuit these days. As indicated, the Columbia class submarine as the highest priority development to replace the Ohio class submarine that serves as the platform for the Trident. The Columbia class submarine will cost $30 billion per copy. And that certainly is a sizable sum by anyone's imagination. Each Trident uh, missile is worth $30 million. And of course, a significant investment in the nation's national security is first and foremost today. So workforce education. I like to differentiate workforce education in along two domains. First of all, we have those that are interested in AI applications. And I would like to posit the idea that there are significant resources available for any um, possibly mature or even uh, somebody out of school for a few years who has been involved in some other line of work and who wishes to pivot into the artificial intelligence slash machine learning workflow. Uh, people like Andrew Ng, Sebastian Thrum, uh, Lex Friedman and others from Stanford and MIT, for example, and those who are involved at uh, Google, uh, Google Mind, Google Brain, 
They've all provided excellent resources, TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, deep learning at mit.edu, and intro, intro to deep learning.com from MIT are all excellent resources. There are what we might call some renegades at Fast AI and OpenAI that all have excellent uh, training materials available. These are all free of charge. You can actually execute code snippets uh, using Google Code Lab uh, under the, uh, the tutorials available from TensorFlow. And um, the, the, uh, I just would encourage everybody to think about applying to some of these, uh, these opportunities. Finally, in the area of workforce education for artificial intelligence. Thank you, Walter. We're going to have to, if you want to take any questions, I think we're going to save that. Okay. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, that's fine. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, if, the, if all of the panelists could now turn their videos and their sounds back on, we'll take some questions from the Q&A. So if you have a question, be sure to type it in. Um, uh, the first I'm actually going to read briefly and then pitch to the next panel. And this is asking with, in parallel to technical advances in computer science education, what's being done to explore some of the ethical aspects, which is the whole next panel, so stay tuned for that. The next one I think makes sense for Sharmila, and this is what AI approaches have been used in healthcare diagnoses. There are quite a few of the, the AI community, I think I could see some in the slides, it's like a huge, uh, big area where, for instance, you know, even trying for the drug development, let's say, you, you, you're looking at the entire data you have available for the genomic sequence, and then trying to piece from that what would be the best, uh, you know, best sort of sequence for a given, for instance, even within, if you look at SARS, there's an entire, you know, data set on the different COVID viruses and how the sequences work out. And a big area is trying to model from that and AI is helping with that, is trying to model and come up with the best protein, even for developing the sensors, which should be the best antibody, which can give you the best detection without confusion and specific kind of a system. So those are all where our AI colleagues are helping us. And I'm sure you can come up with many more of those. I don't know, I can see Walter's light on, so I don't know if he's, you know, if you have more to add, but this is a huge area actually. And we are in the process of trying to even see, for instance, even to get a signal, you know, you can get 10 different kinds of signal. How do you sort it down on which is the best signal to use on the field or remotely, you know, monitor and things like that. Thank you, Sharmila. Uh, this one's for Jason. Um, what are the biggest challenges for K-12 education to be able to prepare students for AI futures? I think the biggest challenges certainly are, are, are there are a couple. One is, is, is resources and making sure that with such a large state with so many different districts and local control, uh, availability to, um, to scale up teacher professional development and develop kind of long-term um, high quality teacher um, pipelines um, for computer science instruction. And then certainly I think we're still figuring out where computer science in K-12 kind of fits into the school day in terms of time and what their priority looks like and, and when it's appropriate to integrate into other courses and when it's appropriate for um, standalone offerings. But the good news is we're making some really good progress, working really collaboratively with partners and I think we're gonna get there um, over the next couple of years. Thank you. Um, Walter, can you say something about what auxiliary skill sets are required to support AI development? So in addition to basic machine learning and uh, the core computer science stuff, data is huge for artificial intelligence. Data science practitioners, I think are very important. Uh, data gathering uh, and then associated activities, instrumentation, hardware engineers are very important in, in many of these domains. So uh, good electrical engineers are terrific for artificial intelligence. <laughs> Not that there's any bias in that opinion. No, not at all, not at all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Sharmila, can you, let's, let's turn it inside out. Can you say something about hey, how AI might influence the field of education? Oh, actually AI, I think is going to change how we teach, right? It's going to change the classrooms, make them a combination of maybe virtual and in-person classrooms. So there's a lot of augmented reality, which is already, especially in areas, let's say right now, 
you know, even to, uh, to look at these medical imaging guys, you know, how they are looking at or building a 3D image of what they got from their MRI and stuff like that. So uh, that is at a higher level, even at a lower level, maybe in K through 12, I can see a lot of augmented reality coming into the classrooms. So the teachers need to really be also be retrained, I think, and we are constantly learning every day is how to say, you know, create firstly the optimum mix of in-person hands-on versus virtual reality and how to help the students understand them. And then also the other part, which is very important for the classroom, AI in the classroom, I feel, is that, you know, sometimes the high achieving students can get a lot and they could be moving in their direction. And then sometimes the students who were falling behind might be going in the wrong direction. So which we are learning as we are offering classes virtually right now is it's a slightly different aptitude needed in the teachers a little bit to stay in par with different students going different directions. And I think AI will just keep increasing that. Thank you. Jason, can you maybe expand on that a little bit and say something more about what K-12 teachers can do now to sort of support their students and that developing the interest and background that those students are going to need to, to advance AI innovation? Yeah, I'd be happy to. I mean, to be honest, um, sessions like this afternoon where teachers are learning about all this wonderful work that's happening that's, that's on the cutting edge in terms of um, research and actually addressing, you know, COVID-19 and healthcare and those types of things. I think um, educators simply can um, can engage in some of these conversations, K-12 educators can engage in some of these conversations, talking to experts, talking to researchers. Um, you know, I think that's really helpful so that they can talk to their students about these are career possibilities. The other thing that we're working on really hard is just um, bringing K-12 educators and higher ed um, institution, faculty, and employers together in the same spaces to have these conversations, to think about local partnerships where they can work together on projects. 12 that um, connects to what they might be learning in an undergrad program. So I, it, a whole variety of options, but I think it just starts with partnership and engagement and asking questions and learning more. Thank you so much. Um, I wish we had more time, but that's all we have. Uh, I, I'm so grateful to these people for sharing their expertise with us. I'd like to thank them for, for taking part in this panel. And I'd like to pass the floor to Charlene Jane, who will lead the next panel on issues of ethics and society.